My name is Sherry Osaka. I'm a licensed landscape architect. I've had my own business for about 22 years, and I've always focused on um, drought tolerant plants, non toxic chemicals in the garden, and saving water as much as possible. I'm trying to stay on the cutting edge, but not too far on the cutting edge. So, we're going to be talking about rain gardens, rain barrels, and cisterns. But first, we're going to st start with some really easy, what I call tankless ways to harvest the rain. I don't know why there's, okay, here, hold on one second. Get that out of the way. Okay, so some tankless ways. Um, and these are just moving a little bit of soil around. So the one lady asked a question about how to change your garden so you can retain water on site. And these would be very simple ways of doing that. And I'll just go through some of these examples pretty quickly. So microbasins, this is actually how the Indians used to um, plant corn. They used to make a little microbasin, plant a piece, plant a seed of corn. As it rained, the um, microbasin filled up with water and, and um, gave a little bit of extra uh, rain to that corn kernel. Just some other examples. There's also terracing. And of course, that's been done for years and years. Um, one of my friends, and you may have seen her a couple weeks ago, Deva Luna did a talk. Um, she has a place that's on a very steep hillside, and she has it all terraced with recycled concrete. And then, of course, in the Andes, they've been doing this for years and years and years. Um, some other things that are a little bit more uh, discreet and underground, uh, something like a French drain. So, what you see here is it's pulling the water from the downspout uh, at least 10 feet away, and that's really important. We really want to keep water at least 10 feet away from the foundation of your house, and that's just to prevent mold, settling, all kinds of things. So really, and you're going to be hear me say that time and time again, keep the water away from your house. And um, when I talk to clients, I always ask them about that. Is there any areas where you're seeing some puddling or pooling? If you see that, that is a great opportunity for putting in some kind of rainwater harvesting issue. So what you see is a, um, what we call a tight line, so a non-perforated line, and then it's going to a bed that has a lot of drain rock in it. It could be just soil, but drain rock just helps it to fill up, and then it releases that water into the ground. Now, one thing that's very important is if you have really good soil, like you've been amending your soil, you've got humus in it, you've got earthworms, all kind of good microbiology in your soil, any dirty water that comes off your roof is going to be cleaned by those soil organisms. Also, if you have a lot of humus in your soil, it's going to be holding. Humus is like a sponge. If you're putting a lot of compost into your soil, now our native plants don't need that, but a little bit. Um, if your soil has a lot of um, natural um, materials in it, not just bare clay, it can hold on to that water for a long time. So that means an area that you're doing something like a French drain, you won't need to water that area as soon as other people do who don't have something like that. Your soil becomes a tank. Okay? You understand that? Great. Okay, so that's a French drain. Um, I do a lot of dry wells because they're, they're pretty easy. It's a great way to get water away from the house. And we're digging down, so I have plenty of places to plant around the dry well. They're usually about, um, again, it's like a, um, it's a tight line. I like a catch basin at the bottom because if you have leaves coming off your downspout, the catch basin will catch a lot of the leaves instead of it going uh, directly into the, um, the, uh, uh, bah, the dry well. So a catch basin to catch the leaves, then a tight line, and then into a dry well. And these are usually about um, four feet deep and maybe 14 inches wide. E every contractor has their different way of doing it. I don't care as long as it's sized properly so that it can hold all that water and then release it slowly. 
Now, one other thing to talk about is um, we know that the old way of doing um, stormwater management was to get it off site and get it into the storm drain as soon as possible. So we we're all sending all of our water out to the storm drain. That's kind of the old way. That's at least 20 years old. Now we're required to keep the water on site. And the reason is, again, keeping it in the soil, it keeps it clean because we have um, a large aquifer in our valley. Did you all know that? We have a big aquifer that we pull a lot of our water from. So anytime we can get lots of water into that aquifer, the better. But also, if we're not all sending our water to the storm drains, we don't get the flooding that we do if um, we keep it on site. So it's a really good way to help us manage our um, utility systems. Um, one thing that deserves maybe a special category is pervious paving. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, here's um, a driveway that I did several years ago. It's pervious concrete with, uh, with brick bands. Here's another driveway done by Aggie Kehoe. Again, the whole driveway is pervious concrete. And then they have a side area of recycled concrete set in some pervious grout. So driveways are really important because they slope. And they slope right to the storm drain. Um, pavement, like walkways in your garden, are a little bit less important. Because the pavement, as the rain hits the pavement, um, the pavement should be sloped so that it drains off. So it's already going to your garden. But a driveway is going right to the storm drain. Also, driveways, you have cars parked on it. And so you may have some oils and gasoline that drips on the driveway. And again, we want to get those things into the soil and not in our creeks and bay. Because um, marine life cannot break down hydrocarbons, but our soil life can. Let me just get a little drink. Mm. Um, here are some different uh, pervious paving pathways. This is at Guadalupe Gardens in San Jose. Uh, this is just decomposed granite, which is kind of a very fine uh, sand. It's actually granite that's um, crushed very fine and then tamped down quite a bit. Uh, so that makes a really nice permeable um, surface. It does have to be maintained a little bit. We also have um, recycled concrete with some pervious grout between it. And then this is um, some flagstone with pervious. And the idea here was just to show that there's really not that much difference between using, looks wise, between using recycled concrete and using um, pavers. Here's some uh, gravel pave, which is a kind of underlayment for a gravel driveway. And this is just, this is for actually an RV that I designed for a client. And the RV is going to be stored behind the fence. And so we just wanted something very low key to, um, to have her drive the, the RV on. <clears throat> Here's a gravel paved driveway done by my friend Stephanie Morris. What I like about this design is, you know, gravel kind of moves around and gets all over the place. So this is really nice because it's got a nice big um, three foot, looks like, a border all around it of concrete. And then this is one of my favorite um, ideas. I mean, this is, this is permeable paving. Um, these are kind of the old style permeable pavers. I mean, flagstone with gravel, that's fine. Uh, this is permeable quarry stone by Calstone. But um, Pacific Interlock now has a paver. Ooh, that was, I'll sh that was the first drawing that I showed or photo that I showed of a driveway. Um, there's no gravel between it. The stones themselves are uh, pervious. The pavers themselves are pervious. Now, a lot of people think that all pavers are pervious. They're not. Most pavers are not pervious. But there are a few um, pavers out on the market that are. Um, but the reason I like this, I'm starting to do this a lot more. So um, replacing your entire driveway 
can be quite a big expense. But I'm finding uh, clients, they'll have a bit of their driveway cracked. So we'll saw cut out that cracked portion of the driveway and then we'll put you know, pervious pavers or some, we'll pour some pervious concrete in that space. Um, this is at the bottom of the driveway. Uh, luckily, it was cracked at the bottom. And then here you see the sidewalk. But you know, even though it's not the whole driveway, it's capturing a lot of water that now stays on site instead of goes to the storm drain. OK. And then here's Mitchell Park. Um, uh, right here, out in front, the, um, the parking out here is all pervious concrete. This is all um, impervious um, asphalt, but then it goes to pervious concrete. And I don't have a picture of this, but if you look, if you go out there, or when you go out there, um, and I think they're gonna, we're going to go out maybe at the break, and you can take a look at it. Um, but the driveway is sloped, so it guys goes to a bioretention basin. So I think that's going to be too bright on the slides, yeah. Um, so it goes to a bioretention basin. So again, all those parked cars, you know, having oil, gasoline, and things on the driveways, all that's going to go into a bioretention, and then the water will be cleaned, and it'll go uh, down into the ground and um, go into our aquifers. Oh, this is the one I was looking for. Yeah, so this is that hydroflow paver by um, Pacific Interlock. And you can see it's a very tight driveway. No weeds grow up in between it um, because the pavers are set really tight together. But the pavers themselves are pervious. Now, if you live in Palo Alto, they do have a rebate for, pervious, for uh, installing pervious pavement. And again, really, I think driveways are probably the most important. Um, Thing. You could do a patio or a walkway, um, but really a driveway is the most important thing that I would spend my extra money on for, for Pervious. Now, I want to say that for all these rebates, you must get permission from the, um, fr from the um, rebate provider before starting out a project. You want to make sure you follow their guidelines so you can get the rebate. Um, and $1.50 a square foot is, is a nice, a very nice rebate. They have a maximum of $1,000, but uh, for residential and commercial, it's $10,000. Okay, so that's kind of pervious paving and, uh, and tankless ways to harvest. This is another tankless way to harvest rain gardens. Do we have any questions on pervious paving? Yes, ma'am. Um, any thoughts on oaks around pervious paving? Any thoughts on oaks around pervious paving? Yes, so um, one of my clients wanted a pathway. It wasn't an oak, it was a um, camphor tree, but it was a very old tree, and they didn't want anything um, impervious because, again, tree roots get a lot of water. You know, you need that water to go into the ground, and also air. So pervious is a lot better for getting water and air. So um, I would be careful to cite the pathway or whatever it is, um, away from any large roots. But I think pervious would be a great choice around an old oak tree. Any other quick questions? For garden pathways, is compacted sand OK? Um, not just regular sand. It really needs to be DG. Sand tends to be, um, the grains tend to be round, and they move around too much. Actually, I have those in my garden in the junk. Well, that's great. Then, then yes, it works. It worked for you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I typically tell people that, um, like a lot of people use, um, gosh, what do they call it? Pammy pebble, which is a very rounded pebble for pathways. And it's like you're swimming. Yeah, it's very hard to walk in it. And the, the decomposed granite is, again, they're sharper. They have more edges. And so they have a tendency to lock in place. But if yours is really packed well down, I think it'll be fine. Oh, builder sand is, is different. Yeah. yeah, it is more coarse than regular sand. Yeah, I think that would be great. Okay. Yes? Do pervious pavers last less long than non-pervious? No, they don't. They last absolutely as, as long. Um, some people worry about 
um, some of the spaces filling up. Um, and there's been talk about, you know, how it has to be vacuumed over time, but I've never experienced that. My contractors have never experienced that. So no, they are, they're very long lasting. Yeah. Okay, and one more and then I really want to move on because I know we're, we're about. Um, the, the hydroflow you'd be a lot better with, that Pacific Interlock paver, because they're really tight together. That doesn't mean you won't get some weed. Some, uh, some seeds are very, very small and you could get a weed, but, but typically I don't see it. And if you do, um, during the rainy season, uh, even during the rain, I would use a flamer on them. Um, just a little flamer, you can get, buy it at um, Peaceful Valley. And uh, you don't do that in the summertime, but, but in the winter you can just use a little flamer and, and flame them. And it just kind of boils it. All right, we're gonna move on to rain gardens because I, I do need to spend a lot of time on that. Um, so rain gardens are um, landscaped depression that receive uh, stormwater runoff and they're usually planted. And the idea is again that um, the water goes in and can take its time to infiltrate into the ground. Okay, so you may actually see some standing water in your rain garden, and that's okay. I mean, that's fine. Um, actually, when there's standing water, it's really good for um, squirrels and birds. It, it really is a good source of water for them. Um, you can be very technical about putting together a rain garden, or you can be more sort of easygoing. And I would say for a client, I'd probably be more technical. For myself, I'm a little bit more um, easygoing in how I design it. Mm. So if you see, for example, going out in front, if you go look at the bioretention, which is kind of like a rain garden, but, but different. It's engineered to hold more water and things like that. You'll see things, oh, this doesn't show it very well. I'll talk about that um, later on. Um, what you see is the soil can be amended. So here they said 40% um, sand, organic matter, and 30% topsoil, um, uncompacted native soil. They're usually about six inches deep is typical. And that doesn't mean you need to dig six inches. It just needs to be the basin is six inches. So as you're digging, you're taking the soil and putting it on the side and creating a basin so that it's, so it's really a lot less digging than you might um, think. One of the reasons I like to have a rain garden is, well, I have an area that floods, so this was a really good solution for me, and I'll show you that. Um, <clears throat> but if you live in our very dry climate, there are some plants that you want to grow that need a lot of water. So this is a perfect solution to expand your gardening um, ability. So um, there's a great homeowner's guide that's on um, the website called Slow It, Spread It, Sink It. It'll give you some uh, really good information. I forget, oh yes, yeah, Santa Cruz, by Santa Cruz County. Um, so I would recommend that. And then I wanna just talk about um, the amounts of rainwater that you could harvest from your site. Um, it's actually a lot more than you think it is. Um, I said one time to uh, somebody at uh, Valley Water District, it's like, we get plenty of water. It just comes all at once. That's really the problem. So this is uh, my house. Uh, what you'll see is I had a lawn here a long time ago. I don't think I have pictures of that. I don't have pictures of it at all. This is all natives now, but you'll see my house. Okay, here it is, front door is there. Um, we do have a pool in the back, but the lot size is about 10,000 square feet. We're really lucky. Uh, I love my um, yard. We get about 15 inches of rain here in Palo Alto, and I'm in San Jose. So we get about the same amount of rain. So 15 inches is one and a quarter feet of, of water. So if I take 10,000 by one and a quarter, 
That's an average amount of rain that we would fall on my house, um, my yard per year. And then we don't really think in terms of cubic feet. I know I don't. I think more in terms of gallons. So if we multiply that by 7 point gallons, 7.48 gallons per cubic foot, really important conversion that you will need. I, if there was one thing I would write down, it's probably that conversion. So sorry, I didn't turn off my phone. Crickets. Hey, Glenn, it's Lauren. Um, so anyways, if you multiply those together, there's 93,000 gallons that falls on my property. Okay? Does anybody know how much water they use in a year? Anybody? Okay, that's a homework assignment. You, it's really important to know that. Um, it, how much water do you use in a year. Oops, I'm so sorry. No, I'm good. Um, so I've done, you figuring it out, Diana? 100 cubic feet, 100 cubic feet a year? No, no, that could be right. Nine, nine cubic feet times 12. Yeah, so about 100 times 7.48. My brain's not working today. What's that? Yes, 748, right. 70, 70, what? My brain is not working today. Not for this. You can either talk or 100 times 748 equals 748 gallons? That can't be right. That can't be right. No, that's really, really low. I mean, you could. Um, so I use, now this is after years and years of conserving. So I use 38,000 gallons of water inside and outside. So pretty low, pretty low. Um, OK, now, but really, we can't capture the water that falls in our garden. Really, what we can capture it's easiest to capture the water that falls on our roof, right? That's much easier. Everything gets collected in your gutters, goes down your downspout. So let's look at my roof area. Now, your roof area is different than the size of your house, right? Because you have overhangs and things like that. So you might need to do a little bit of measuring in order to figure this out. So my roof area is 4,800 square feet. I have some really, it's a ranch style house. I have some really deep overhangs. So let's do that calculation again. Um, 4,800 times 1.25. And so that's, you know, 45,000 gallons. If I could save all that water, I could cover, I could use no water from the city. Oh, yeah, that would be a great feeling. Um, but, you know, still, I'd have to have some big tanks and, and things like that. But still, the, the idea is we have plenty of water. We have plenty of water. We just need to figure out ways to kind of save it. And as I said before, if you have an area that is not draining well, that is, the, that is a great area to start with. So we'll look at that we have probably a very big roof area. This is all paved. This is all paved. Here's the area that that water can infiltrate into. It's not big enough, right? And we know that there must be some ponding, because look, we can see that the foundation is wet. Do you see that? Do you see that wetness there that's wicking up the foundation? So this would be, darn it. So this would be a really great area to put, you know, at least a rain barrel or something. Or I would get rid of some of the um, concrete. I don't know that you need all that concrete there. OK. So why, keep, why create a rain garden? It saves water, right? You're going to be irrigating less because you're going to be really watering this whole area all winter long and getting this, the soil really saturated. It reduces water pollution 
because it's going into the ground and it's getting cleaned. And also, every time we save water, we also save energy. Because in California, 15 to 20 percent of all of our energy use is related to water. Moving it. Think about the 444 mile long state water project, right? As you drive down Highway 5, uh, that's the state water project. So moving the water, cleaning the water, and then heating the water takes 15 to 20 percent of all our electricity. It's very good for wildlife and biodiversity. It replenishes our local uh, ground aquifers. It reduces the heat island effect. So even in the, maybe not the middle of summer, it may have dried out by then, but if you've got that water in the ground, it's transpiring, um, it's evaporating, and it's keeping the area a little bit cooler. So it saves water and um, reduces waste. Additional benefits, you're definitely going to want to be keeping the water away from the foundation of your house. Look for those areas where you get some ponding. Those are the first ones that I would tackle. Um, they, they're, they're very fun to watch. You know, you, I mean, um, you get this nice gurgling little, little um, rain garden. Um, they're good for play and, and garden microclimates. So here's a residential rain garden. And like I said, you can make them as complicated or as simple as you want. Um, this one has maybe a perforated pipe down below. If you just want to make absolutely sure that you're not getting overflow or anything like that, you're not going to need that. Um, here's a overflow structure. So if you have uh, again, if you want to make sure that this area is never going to flood or anything like that, um, you're going to want a drain structure in it. I'm sure there's one out in the bioretention area out front. And usually you'll see the drain is not set at ground level. It's set up, right? We want that area to fill up as much as possible. And only once it's going to overflow does the water then go into the drain. Okay? All right. Um, here again, they've kind of engineered the soil. This time it's 50%, 50 to 60% sand, compost, topsoil. I just used topsoil on mine. Um, and then native plants, again, they're going to help the process of um, cleaning the soil, and they're going to look beautiful, too. Um, you could do a dry stream to your rain garden. You could do a um, tight pipe, you know, not a perforated pipe um, that goes underground to your rain garden. You have lots of different options. But again, the rain garden should be 10 feet away from your house. You can get um, rebates from the Santa Clara Valley Water District. It's a dollar per square foot of roof area, up to $300 per site. And by the way, if you situate it in an area where you're taking out lawn, you can get the dollar a square foot lawn rebate and the rain garden rebate on top of that. They don't usually combine rebates in this way, but for this one they do. And again, remember to get permission from them before you start anything. 